It's a great pleasure uh, and honour to be asked uh, by the chairpersons to talk on this subject. And um, I'd like to uh, 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 present my disclosures to you. Uh, another disclosure, and you've already heard, that I've been asked to talk about um, surgery, and I'm not a surgeon. These things in the background are chemicals. I'm a medical oncologist. So whether I'm better placed than my surgical colleagues remains debatable. Actually, one of the key things to start off is, um, is to say that surgery in the esophagus is big surgery. And um, this, uh, this is a really nice piece of work from Jane Blaisby uh, in, in Bristol, in the UK. And what she shows in this slide, the take-home message is that if you have an operation, an esophageal gastrectomy, um, then it, it takes a long time to get your quality of life back. And unless you survive more than two years, so that subgroup of patients who don't survive more than two years basically never recover the quality of life. So although we've made a lot of advances in, in um, surgical specialization, uh, in post-operative care, and mortality rates are now very low from this operation, it should not detract from the morbidity of the procedure. And for those patients where the surgery doesn't cure the patient, they may never recover to a level that they had before the operation. So that's just a, a, a point to, to make, and it, it is important to, to, to bear that in mind. Other factors influencing uh, the decision to operate are, are really based on two major uh, 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 areas. First is the patient, and that could be the patient preference. I don't want to have a major operation doctor. It could be that the patient's too unfit for what is, after all, radical surgery. And then you have to look at the, the tumor characteristics, and we'll look at histology, squamous versus adenocarcinoma, location of the tumor, the stage, the response to neoadjuvant therapies, and of course, the, how, how can we use biomarkers to determine where we would want to operate. So actually, when you look at uh, esophageal cancer, what, what you find is that, um, oh, I'm just trying to work it. How does this point on there? Is it, is it, am I, oh, okay, great, lovely, thanks. Got it. Um, if you, this is still not working. If you look at esophageal cancer, of course, tumors of the upper third are, are generally squamous. Tumors of the lower third are generally adenocarcinoma. Tumors of the upper third are much greater technical challenge and uh, may involve um, uh, procedures that are much more difficult to make a, a good recovery from and where there is significant morbidity. And of course, this um, has led to the, this sort of paradigm where as you go um, up the esophagus, people are thinking much more about definitive chemoradiation uh, and avoiding surgery. And of course, as you move up the esophagus, you're moving into squamous territory. Whereas as you go down the esophagus, we're thinking about uh, 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 neoadjuvant chemoradiation and then surgery. And as we look at the junction uh, type 1 and 2, they're moving into type 3, we can see the difference between uh, a preoperative strategy involving chemoradiation and a preoperative strategy involving chemotherapy. Just to remind you that, that this is a, a, a fairly up-to-date stage-by-stage uh, uh, -stage, uh, 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 survival uh, in patients with um, esophageal cancer, adeno and squamous. And essentially, once that tumor gets into the submucosa and beyond, these patients don't really have a good prognosis. So we have to bear in mind early-stage disease is relatively uncommon. Um, and for early stage disease, an endoscopic, non-surgical approach uh, may be appropriate, particularly for the uh, uh, mucosal uh, uh, disease. But once that tumor gets through the muscularis mucosa, the risk of lymph node disease increases quite substantially. 
So for the, the majority of patients, these, these patients really require a multimodality approach. And in a way, this is why people are now saying, well, there's a multimodality approach here that involves some sort of preoperative strategy and then an operation. Do you really need to do the operation? Where can you avoid the operation? Where should you definitely do the operation? And that's, I think, you know, where we are in, in, in this current uh, uh, debate. Firstly, if we look at some of the objective evidence, um, and uh, in this, this case, let, let's, let's look at adenocarcinoma versus squamous carcinoma. I mean, I generally don't adhere to the notion that these patients should go into the same trials. I don't believe they should be treated in the same way. They are fundamentally different diseases. They just happen to be in the esophagus. Um, you wouldn't treat a lymphoma in the esophagus the same way as you would treat esophageal cancer. So, and, and the key message here really is that, and many people in this room will know that, but the, the, the complete response to chemoradiation is much higher in squamous carcinoma than in adenocarcinoma, and thus the opportunity for avoiding surgery is greater. And if we look at, for example, the cross trial using carboplatin and paclitaxel, uh, the complete response rate for squamous tumors was close to 50%. And please bear in mind, the dose of radiotherapy here was the so-called preoperative dose of radiotherapy at 41.1 gray. Uh, and also, and I'll come on to this a bit later, but a bit like um, we've seen with squamous cancers of the anus, PATH-CR is an evolving process. Patients don't, don't go into PATH-CR straight away. They gradually go into PATH-CR. And, and the way in which they obtain PATH-CR is very interesting. And the more we understand, for example, about immuno-oncology, the more we're beginning to think that this, is, this may not always just be a chemoradiation effect. It may be a much later effect. It may be partly immunological. In adenocarcinoma, uh, the path CR rates are generally lower, and um, the top three uh, 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 trials here relate to chemotherapy uh, alone, and the bottom th four trials here relate to uh, chemo, chemo radiation. And the take home message is that with adenocarcinoma, the chances of obtaining a pathological complete response at the moment is somewhere in the region of 0 to 15%. And it would appear that the more drugs you use, the more likely you are to get a pathological complete response rate. Uh, but that does mean that um, there's a substantial number of patients where path CR will not be attained. With chemoradiation, the, the results are, are higher. And probably one of the highest is reported in the so-called NEOSCOPE trial, which is a, a UK study using uh, oxaliplatin capecitabine followed by chemoradiation with um, a, a carbopatin paclitaxel, in which they reported a 28% complete pathological response rate. So the higher path CR rate, actually the greater the possibility is for, for offering uh, a non-surgical approach. So actually if we look at uh, squamous cell carcinoma, um, th these are two randomized studies which are not entirely squamous tumors, but they're nearly all squamous tumors. Um, from Biden and, and from Stahl, and, and actually taken in conjunction with the Cochrane Review recently published, the conclusion was that chemoradiation appears to be at least equivalent to surgery in terms of short and long-term survival uh, in people with esophageal cancer of squamous cell type who are fit for surgery and are responsive to induction chemotherapy. And remember, that's the way these patients were selected for the trials. So, if, if you adopt that sort of approach, and, and certainly uh, in, in our institution, our squamous tumors, we treat with definitive chemoradiation, uh, and those who go into CR, we follow up. Um, well, then the questions are, if you're looking for a pathological complete response, when do you look? How do you assess that response? And ha what's your sort of follow-up path pathway likely to be? Well, this is quite interesting data. Um, you can see that 
on the left hand side, your uh, yeah, your your right hand side. Um, so your left hand side, you have the um, biopsies taken at the time of chemo radiation. And what they show is that if you go biopsy negative, you've got a better prognosis than if you still have a positive biopsy during chemo radiation treatment. But what I'd also point out that even if you have a positive biopsy during radiotherapy treatment, that you can still do quite well. And the reason is that biopsying during chemo radiation is far too early. You know, we would generally uh, wait three months before we did a formal assessment of response unless we suspected the patient was progressing. Because if you look too early, then you will, you will underestimate the likelihood of attaining a complete response. Also, PET scanning uh, can be utilized to, to pull out those patients who have had a complete remission. And the later you wait, the more robust that information will be. In the SCOPE 1 trial, again, a UK study, um, uh, and these were patients that were a sort of odd group. There were a mixture of patients who declined surgery, who were deemed unfit for surgery, where there was a, 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 you know, a patient choice, where there was an MDT view. Uh, and actually, uh, what uh, Tom Crosby and his colleagues reported was that, actually, if you're failure-free at 12 weeks, then you've got a median survival of 26.7 months with chemo rad alone. So th this is quite an important observation. Just beginning to, to, to give us more information about adenocarcinoma. Uh, when may, might there be a role for surgery? When might there be a role for a more conservative approach? Another interesting point about salvage surgery, and I'll just use this, this slide here to illustrate that. And, and this is essentially looking at a group that compared the survival of people who had upfront chemo-rad surgery with upfront chemo-rad then surgery as a so-called salvage procedure. And in fact, they seemed to do very, they had a similar uh, survival. And that does indicate that, that there may be the possibility to, to use salvage surgery as the uh, 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 approach uh, for patients with, a, with esophageal disease. So get them into remission and hold back the surgery for patients who don't achieve a, a, a complete response or where the disease is relapsing. But you can only do this if you follow those patients up carefully. So I think that, that, that however, in adenocarcinoma, the, the role for non-surgical management is, is, is much less compelling. Um, here you can see a series of trials showing that actually the outcome for definitive chemo radiation seems to be improving. That's probably a composite of better staging, and much better quality control in the radiotherapy, um, using more chemotherapy. But actually these trials were largely squamous tumors. So I think that, 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 that we don't have so much data with uh, 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 adenocarcinoma. Biomarkers, uh, tumor characteristics, and this is for people. Now I'm thinking about if you've got an adenocarcinoma. I think for squamous cancers, you know, the evidence is becoming really quite compelling that, that an, an, a non-surgical strategy is, is a very reasonable approach. For the adenocarcinomas, who, who's going to do well with chemo radiation? Who's going to do badly? And this is quite interesting. The signet ring uh, subtypes do badly, but they do badly anyway. Uh, uh, but the biomarkers for lack of achieving a complete response with a chemo radiation approach might select out the patients who need an operation. Tumor regression grade correlates really very strongly with survival. This is the OEO5 study. Uh, which is 800 patients we presented at ASCO last year. And, and the message here is, is that, that we gave at that time is that tumor regression grade one or two is basically a CR or near CR. These patients do very well. The patients who have very little in the, in the way of tumor regression uh, do relatively badly. And, and only one in four of those patients will enjoy long-term survival. The Muricon trial, I use this to just to illustrate that, that in this study, 
which was designed to use PET as a, a biomarker for changing treatment. But actually what they also showed was that if you go PET negative, you actually do very well uh, with a preoperative uh, strategy approach. And, and it begs the question that maybe in there there's a subset of patients who don't actually need surgery. Actually, the, as we've seen in esophageal gastric cancer, that, that we, we tend to lag behind other tumor types in relation to biomarkers um, uh, uh, for response predicting outcome. This is quite an interesting piece of work uh, published in Cancer two years ago. And this is using microRNA and a scoring system uh, that was eventually designed around four uh, uh, microRNAs and uh, came from the MD Anderson. And what they found was that using this microRNA score, they could actually pick out, if you look across the bottom, the MEP score, zero up to five, and it depends how, how many of um, the microRNAs were overexpressed, gave you a score. You know, one, two, three, or four overexpressed. And actually, if there was underexpression of, 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 of all four of the markers, uh, the, the chances of obtaining a pathologic complete response was extremely high. So this is a preoperative test that might allow you to, to pull out that subset of patients who will have a very good response, and by the same token, the subset of patients where you won't achieve a path CR with chemoradiation. And then, of course, there's the questions, if you don't have a response, should you, should you actually treat these patients at all? And on the uh, uh, right-hand side is the REO2, which is one of our advanced disease studies uh, with ECX against EOX. And actually, the point I'm trying to sh make here is that actually within that, the locally advanced disease group did really quite well, comparatively speaking, to the patients who didn't respond to chemo and went on to have an operation. So maybe that's another subset where we shouldn't respond. And one final word uh, is just to say about metastatic disease, because we're talking about surgery in esophageal cancer. Um, should we ever operate on metastatic disease? And then actually there is, there is emerging data that there may be a small subgroup of patients uh, with oligometastatic disease where an operation uh, particularly on liver metastases, limited, liver limited disease, may actually produce some degree of um, um, long-term survival, uh, particularly in patients who respond to chemotherapy. So who should we operate on? Um, early node negative disease, um, obviously locally advanced disease not achieving a path CR with neoadjuvant therapy. Possibly not for surgery. Of course, are they, are they very early tumors where endoscopic mucosal resection is sufficient? Squamous cancer, I think that, that we've certainly moved into uh, a, 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 a phase of definitive chemoradiation. Um, local advanced disease, adenocarcinoma, this is still debatable, but as we get better biomarkers and, and better treatment for local advanced disease, I'm sure we'll be able to avoid surgery in, in patients. And of course, those people are unfit, or medically uh, unfit, or who decline treatment, or uh, in the presence of metastatic disease with a few uh, notable and highly selected uh, exceptions to this rule. Thank you very much.